Welcome to Coastlines and Coffee. I'm saying that really loudly so Donna will stop talking and snap to <laughs> attention. Welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you here on this beautiful Sunday, Sunday, sunny Sunday morning. Dare I say spring-like? Dare I hope? Um, I want to give the land acknowledgement. Um, we acknowledge the lands on which Memorial University's campuses are situated. They're in the traditional territories of diverse indigenous groups, and we acknowledge with respect the histories and culture of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this province. We encourage everyone to reflect on the lands uh, where you are located, to find the joy in those lands, to read the TRC recommendations, and perhaps even investigate the land back movement um, as a way of giving respect to the ownership, uh, the indigenous ownership of our land. So welcome to the Amira Innovation Center here at Signal Hill. And to those watching online, I don't know where to look. Oh, there's the camera. Uh, I'm Angela Antle, and uh, I'm thrilled to be back here uh, hosting Coastlines. I love doing this. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a writer. I'm a memorial alumnus, BA Honors 91. Uh, <laughs> a current PhD candidate. Yes, I went back to school, and I'm hoping before I get my old age pension, I will have a PhD. <laughs> That's my goal. <laughs> so I'm very pleased to introduce you to uh, Allison Graves and Donna Morrissey, a great pair. We were just saying how Allison looks like Emma Stone. Do you agree? Do you agree? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> We're going to make her blush all through this. Allison's Soft Serve Collection is her first book. It's a collection of short stories. And Donna's Rage the Night, definitely not her first. Eighth? Ninth? Eighth. Eighth. Oh, I thought you said eighth. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to take questions from the audience later on, so have your question ready. Uh, and I want to start out um, with Allison, uh, who received her BA in English Lit from Dalhousie University, her MA from, uh, in Creative Writing from Munn. 
uh, where she wrote this collection of short stories. Her fiction has won Room Magazine's annual fiction contest, which is quite an accomplishment. The Newfoundland Arts and Letters Award. She's originally from Ontario, but she's connected to Belle Island. She's the current fiction editor of Riddle Fence. Uh, she's doing a PhD at Memorial in contemporary Irish uh, feminist fiction. And she likes to play drums. She serves sometimes at Portage, no, Ter, Portage. And uh, you can find her on the hill every day. She climbs Signal Hill. So uh, you're going to do a reading from Soft Serve for us? Sure, yeah. Every day? Are you up there every day? Every day, yes. Every day. I touch the tower in the same spot every day. Oh. For like five years, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. Change my life. Um, I'm going to read the first story from this collection. Um, sorry to anyone that came to my launch because it's the same story I read then. Um, it's about Snowmageddon and getting trapped in a house with a bunch of girls. One of them's here. Um, <laughs> all right, it's called, <laughs> one of them got out, yeah. It's called Ceiling Like the Sky. 100 centimeters of snow fell and our house was completely buried. I lived in a cold and winding house in downtown St. John's with three other girls. Grace was on vacation with her family in Thailand and kept sending us videos of her on the beach sipping drinks with umbrellas in them. We told her to stop, but she insisted. <laughs> the first day wasn't so bad. Franny got really high off a pre-roll she bought from the Tweed store on Water Street and kept reminding us how smart she was for getting weed before the storm. She convinced Lily to share a pre-roll and Lily started hyperventilating while we watched Dry Grace. She was losing her mind thinking about how we had no way out and kept telling me that if it came down to it, because my room was only a couple feet from the top of the snowbank, that I would have to jump out the window and start digging. I told her I would, but that didn't regulate her breathing. I worked at a restaurant downtown and was sleeping on and off with my boss, Rick, who was my best friend for years. He messaged me first thing after the snowfall saying he slipped a disc shoveling and understood why we were anxious because he would have to spend the next week horizontal. I told him it wasn't exactly the same, but he said it was close. His girlfriend, Courtney, was at her parents' house helping them shovel out, and Rick was concerned about how he would fill up his Nalgene. Anytime something didn't work out with someone he was dating, Rick would come back to me. He understood that I loved him and wanted to be together, but would remind him, me every time that the stakes were too high. I was too important for him to lose. His dishonesty and flimsiness of character were traits I saw regularly but ignored. It was like I was ski racing and I was getting hit in the face by the red flags over and over again, but I just kept going. The girls in the house were unanimous in thinking that Rick had been treating me like shit for years. I'd had frank conversations with them about it before and I would listen to their advice and then I would completely exhaust them by ignoring the advice they gave. I could feel myself doing this and it made me feel embarrassed, but that didn't make me stop. Franny started making cookies and tidying up the living room. Then she rolled out a pie dough while the oven was preheating, and I could tell that she was high as a kite. Franny was probably the most anxious of all of us, but she could hide it when she wanted to. I think we should watch all the UK Love Island starting at season one, Franny yelled from the kitchen. We've already seen them all, Lily replied, but the first two are actually so great because they're more real. It's before they started like censoring all their behavior. I'm down, I said. I think it's going to be at least until tomorrow before we can dig out. Lily's phone rang, and it was Grace FaceTiming us from Thailand. Grace's sisters were in the background, and they were all fighting. Grace was clearly drunk because her eyes were glassy and her cheeks were red. I thought she looked pretty. I wish I was there with you guys, she said. This is so shit. Nothing interesting ever happens in town, and I leave, and you guys get three days off work trapped in the house. <laughs> we're starting Love Island from season one, Franny yelled from the kitchen as her timer went off. Oh my god, you guys, those are my favorite seasons. When we hung up, Lily said she wished Grace was there and that something didn't feel right without her. We started watching Love Island until it got dark out and I felt slightly panicked that I couldn't leave the situation even if I wanted to. We'd finished Franny's cookies and I was desperate for a walk. Rick was messaging me about how he was having a Cronenberg marathon with Courtney and I swear I could have barfed right there and then. I don't know, we don't even really talk anymore, Rick texted about Courtney. It's like we're existing on different planets or something. I didn't respond, but he could see that I'd read the message. I don't know, she really wants kids, and I told her I could never do that. I told Lily and Franny that I was going to the bathroom, and I went upstairs and sobbed into my pillow until I heard the Love Island theme song downstairs signaling the beginning of a new episode. I grabbed my phone from where I'd left it on my desk, and I had 11 missed messages from Rick, all saying, I'm sorry, and asking if it was too much information, and how sometimes he didn't know how to navigate our relationship. 
Sorry, I don't want you to feel like I'm a shitty guy. You're so important to me. Really, I don't know what I would do without you. I messaged him back and told him it was fine. Sorry, we're watching Love Island and it's seriously insane. I feel like my brain's getting mushy, lol. When I came downstairs, my face was red and Franny looked at me and knew I was upset, but she didn't ask. My relationship with Rick had been hardest on Franny. She'd been there since the start and she understood every contour of it. Franny was the type of person who believed that when she gave advice, people were going to take it. And each time I ignored her and put myself in a position to get hurt, Franny moved slightly further away from me. I could feel it. Each time I tried to explain by telling her I was a control freak and these things weren't as easy for me as they were for her. I told her she was freer than I was. This time she didn't ask though. I had weird dreams all night that I couldn't remember in the morning and I blamed Love Island. When I came down the stairs the next morning, Franny was watching Videodrome on the TV in the living room and she'd hung up wool blankets I'd collected since childhood on the large windows as to not let the light in. Rick told me he was watching this last night. He's having a Cronenberg marathon, I said as I sat down on the couch she wasn't using. That's cool. I was having these weird dreams all night. I think the contrast between like Love Island and Snowmageddon has my brain all twisted, I said, biting my thumbnail so hard it was painful. Did you know all these Love Island contestants keep killing themselves? It's all so eerie. Dude, can you just like let me watch this? It's almost done. All right, fine, I said. I went upstairs and I called my mom and I told her Franny had pinned my nice blankets to the wall and it made me upset. My mom told me she was worried and detailed some of the crazy storms she'd lived through growing up in Newfoundland. Remember what happened to your cousin in Grand Falls? He was out playing in the snow when he was just four years old and the snowplow buried him. He was under there for over an hour and he was fine. I guess he had like a little air pocket or something he was breathing through. Jesus, I said, even though I knew my mom didn't like it when I used that language. This is why I get scared, sweets. You guys have to be careful getting out of the house. Your father and I were watching here and now and they called in the army to plow the highways, baby. I promised her we would be careful and that we were fine. I went back downstairs and Franny was at the part of the movie where the videotape is coming out of James Woods' abdomen. The whole thing made me feel hungry. When Lily came downstairs, it was almost noon and she told us that she'd been in her room watching anime and drawing. I googled Snowmageddon and it said that Snowpocalypse and Snowzilla are also words the press uses to describe storms of mass massive proportions, she said. Isn't that funny? That's when Franny complained she was running low on weed because she'd smoked so much yesterday and she'd binge eaten too many cookies and was feeling unbelievably bloated. She said she missed her boyfriend Ross who was doing a PhD in Toronto and she felt alone and scared and trapped. She said she couldn't hear me talk about Rick anymore without losing her mind and that Love Island and Videodrome and the steady stream of Snowmageddon photos on Instagram had made her brain feel fucked. She said she wanted to do something productive because it was the first time she'd had a few days off work, but she couldn't concentrate on anything, so she'd bought a small top with strings you wrap around your back for Maurizia for $120. I reminded her she would never wear a top like that in town, and she started crying and said, I know, okay? So loudly it almost bounced off the walls. I need to get out of here, she said between labored breaths. Someone needs to get us out of here. I knew she meant the house, but I thought something bigger was going on. I wanted to be a better friend to her, but I was barely hanging on myself. I wanted to tell her about my cousin surviving in the air pocket after getting buried with snow, but I didn't think it would help. Lily's boyfriend, Jonathan, came to dig us out that afternoon, and three other neighbors pitched in to help. I watched them from my bedroom window and was happy I hadn't tried to jump. Jonathan created a tunnel to the road, and we kept it that way for a week because it was funny. The day after we were freed, Rick asked me if I wanted to go to the Golden Phoenix on Kenmount for all-you-can-eat buffet. At this point, we'd talked so much since the comment about him and Courtney having kids that I'd convinced him and maybe myself that it was all okay. The drive to Golden Phoenix and Rick's Corolla was dicey as, at best, and we slid for half a block coming down freshwater. When we got there, I had more food than I'd had in ages and chalked it up to the scarcity mindset given rationing while the city was shut down. I think Franny's mad at me, I told Rick as I shoved a chicken ball in my mouth in one bite. Franny's a bit temperamental, she'll be okay, Rick said. I thought it was rich that he would be calling anyone else temperamental, and I, but I didn't say anything. I just made a mmm sound like I agreed with him. How was the Cronenberg Marathon after? It was all right. Courtney got grossed out when the guy's head explodes in scanners, so she made me turn on something else. I laughed and secretly wished he would stop talking to me about Courtney. I don't know, she just really doesn't understand or appreciate body horror, Rick said. He had some red sauce by his mouth and it looked like blood almost. Did you, did you ever notice if you look up at the ceiling here, it's painted like the sky? I looked up and appreciated it for what felt like minutes. 
the gold light fixtures hung down in the middle of the sky. I think it's kind of beautiful, Rick said. Really? I lowered my head and looked at him. It makes me feel trapped. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Allison Graves reading from Soft Serve. That's okay. <laughs> All right, so now it's Donna's turn. Uh, Donna Morrissey, also another Mun grad, BSW, Bachelor of Social Work, yeah. 92. Um, she's the author of the nationally best selling memoir, Pluck, which was a finalist for the Atlantic Book Awards Nonfiction Award, and of six acclaimed and best selling novels. Her latest, Rage of the Night, is a riveting account of the 1914 Newfoundland ceiling disaster. Among Donna's honors are the Thomas Riddell Atlantic Fiction Award, the Arthur Ellis Award for Best Crime Fiction for The Fortunate Brother. Sylvanus now was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers' Prize, and The Deception of Livy Higgs was a one-read pick for Nova Scotia in 2017. Her fiction has also won awards in the US and UK and has been translated into several languages. Born and raised in Newfoundland and a graduate of Mun, she lives in Halifax, and if you're in the market, she's selling her, her house. She's what? <laughs> if you're in the market, you're selling your house. It's on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> So, Donna, um, you're going to read from yeah, your uh, story? I've, I've never read that. Sitting Down before. You can, so, you can go to the podium if you prefer. Yeah, I, I can't read Sitting Down. I can do this. Yeah, okay. Am I do this? And I can't see. Okay. All right, I'll do this. <laughs> I also want to show off my new belt. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to read a piece from the book that, um, it's from the very beginning of the book. Uh, I know that there's a big deal about the uh, Newfoundland ceiling disaster that comes at the end, but the book is really a coming of age story about a young man called Rowan who goes looking for himself and he finds himself on the ice. So I'm just going to read to you from the beginning and um, it's going to conflict with all the things that's going to show up there. So. Um, here he is, he's uh, 19 years of age, he's in the Great Northern Peninsula with Dr. Grenfell. He has just discovered a horrible thing about his past um, and he is sitting out, as they say in the Westers, he's going to find his paw. <laughs> and Grenfell has been his mentor and it's in the middle of the night here. So Grenfell appears before him in the dark. The light from the lanterns he's holding sways over the blanket wrapped around his shoulders and a fur cap lopsided on his head. Anne just told me, he says to Rowan, just this thing. Tell me again, Rowan, what did the old nurse say? Annie, she was too distraught. She said, said Rowan, that my mother died giving me life. She said that my father gave me to another woman birthing alongside of her. She said he falsified my death, and then he buried me along with my mother. No, no, said Grenfell. I question all of it, Rowan. I question it. Nurse Ivy, she wasn't in her right mind. She told the truth, sir, and I'll be leaving now to discover the whole of it. Leaving? Grenfell pauses. He takes in the packed comatect, the harnessed dogs, you're not coming back, are you? Where are you going? To Williamswood, sir. There was an address in Nurse Ivy's room. Williamswood? Sure, I've never heard of such a place. Wait till morning, Rowan. I'll go with you. Now, Rowan is silent. Well, surely you're not leaving us. I must go now, sir. But go where, Rowan? This is your home, here with us. Why, Ivy and me, we want you to study with us, Rowan to work with us. And he ends with a pleading look on his youthful face. And his eyes, they are knowing eyes from seeing the world. And his hands are strong and warm, his arms long from curling into the coves and hamlets of this great northern peninsula, gathering the starved and the diseased. He disinfects them of vermin, he burns their rags and washes and dresses their wounds, and he dresses them in his own clothes and rows half naked back to his ship, 
taking with him the desperate, the frightened orphan waifs, like me. Thanks, Roland. Like he brought me. But I was an orphan, now was I? I was buried alive. I am most grateful, sir, but I've taken enough from you. Taken? Well, what do you mean by that? Do we not all take? Do we not all take refuge in the grace of God? Well, let us now give back together, you and me. Rowan, please, what do you hope to find in this Williamswood? I'm not looking for anything, sir. Just the truth. The truth? Ha, you're looking for much more than that. I can see it in you right now. You're looking for your family, your village. But this is your village. This is where you belong. He gestures the encompassing outport and his hospital and orphanage. He grips Rowan's shoulders. This is where I belong, right here. But you chose this place, sir. You adopted us. You chose to come to this place. Adopted? Why, what do you mean, adopted? It's been years since I've thought of my place of birth. I scarcely think of grandfathers and great-grandfathers. I think only of my work here. I think only of you, of me, of this moment. And Rowan falters. He falters before those eyes that carry the stillness and clarity of a torn gap mountain pool as seen only by birds. Perhaps I will return, but I must go. It won't ever let me sleep if I don't go. But wait, please, Rowan, you upset me. Are we not all orphans? Have we not all been abandoned or betrayed at one time or another? Are we not all the one tribe beneath the stars? I don't expect you to understand, sir. But I do understand. This land, this people, they've taken me in. They let me serve them. Why, a little boy, he gave me his puppy in return for two stitches in his thumb. What grace is that? What loveliness? Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And they come to me, Rowan. They make me as I make them, and glad I am to be their orphan. And glad I am, sir, to have been yours. But I must go now. Oh, come now, Rowan. You are more than one of Grenfell's orphans. Oh, yes, yes, I've heard the names. I've heard what they've called you. I don't expect you to understand, sir. Stop saying that. It's you who don't understand. We are of God. We can't go back any further than that. It doesn't matter what road brought us to this remote soil. Only who we are that walk on it. You're who you are meant to be right here with us right now. No, sir, I am not. I know nothing of who I am. I was pronounced dead to the world and then secreted away to strangers and brought here by an old nurse who fed me lies. Oh, says Grenville. So you think then that life will be better amongst brothers? You think life is better between sisters and mothers? This world, my son, is rough with disharmony between brothers, between sons and fathers. I'm not looking for a father. Oh, I don't believe you. You think this father of yours, you think he wears a hair shirt and he's waiting for you? He abandoned you, remember that. Not even a name on your headstone. Oh, Rowan, you're hurting. Well, at least it's a feeling now, isn't it? He turns to his comatech. He hears Grenfell's sharp intake of breath. Rowan, are you so emptied? A name, sir. Who the hell doesn't have a last name besides me? A name. Oh, dear Lord, Rowan, I've missed things. I see the old of a thing, and I miss its smallest elements, its working parts. Anne and I, we, we could have given you our name. No, no, you've given enough. Please, it's for me now. I must find my smallest thing. Let me do that. Let me find my name. And Grenfell, he is slow to nod. But what will you do then, should you find this, this family? 
Will you want retribution from them? What justice do you seek? I don't know. When I get there, I expect I will find my purpose for having done so. And Grunfeld nods. May you always have a purpose, my son. What good is a man if he doesn't have a purpose, I agree. When there is no vision, the people perish. That is the proverb of a king. And one last thing, my son. When you reach this place, this, this Williamswood, be patient. Let things come to you. You have worked hard for your pride. Don't let it become your yoke. I've left the lamp burning, says Rowan. He strides back to the shed, extinguishes the light. The dogs yap with impatience. Renfield stands back, his mouth working as he grasps for something more to hold him, but he can find nothing. And Rowan leaps onto the back ends of the sled's runners. Grenfell rushes forwards. Us mortals, he calls out. We're no more than grass of the field. You remember that? The wind passes over and it's gone and its place knows it no more. You remember those words, Rowan. This is our life, yours and mine. There is no past. There is only what is needed from us right here, right now. You remember that. You remember that, Rowan. I remember, sir. And Grenfell, he grasps his hands and he holds them tight to his chest. Then he drops them. And Rowan lifts his reins and yells, hoish, hoish, and the dogs spring ahead, tandering over the crusted snow through the dawning light, the sled swinging in pursuit. And Rowan, he struggles to keep from looking back. A deep sadness overtakes him, a sense of loss, but he will not look back. He will not look back. And then she comes to him, she from the grave beneath the snow-laden birch tree, whispering through its naked limbs, don't listen, don't listen, you are my son. His words are for himself, not you. We are rooted to our past. We are its seeds blossoming into time. Don't listen to him, Rowan. Don't listen, don't listen. There. Thank you. Okay, that's all over with. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. Uh, I have to tell you that we were on a Coastlines call and uh, librarian Bonnie Morgan is here with us. She's one of our partners. <laughs> her brother had texted her and said, boy, that raged night. That's some dandy read. <laughs> Lays it down for an hour and goes back. Brendan told Mutter he couldn't put it down. <laughs> God love Brendan. <laughs> so, uh, wow, it's two really different books, but both with rich settings and authentic dialogue and 110 years apart. Um, I'm, I'm going to start, uh, Allison, with you. Um, this is a collection of short fiction, and I have a good quote about your book as well from the editor of Atlantic Books who said on social media, I gobbled up all 19 stories like they were melting ice cream, and how can you resist when the engine turns on the first sentence in nearly every story? Like when I told my mother I was gay, she threw an egg at me. <laughs> can you talk about the importance of that corkscrew of energy at the beginning of a story? Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like uh, when I was younger, sometimes it's funny to talk about these stories because I wrote them like, five, six years ago. Yeah, and um, you know, I try to remember exactly how I felt at that time. I feel like I would see an image or my friend would tell me a story and I would be like, I'm writing that down in the notes app on my phone. And I was reading a lot of like Miranda July, who we just talked about, Lydia Davis, Laurie Moore, kind of like quirky uh, women mostly. And I was kind of like, intrigued by the punchiness of like the first sentence you know it was like it's it's hopefully they're funny which I think was you know what I was trying to do with a lot of those images for sure what did you learn about yourself uh, writing this collection I know like you said it spanned five years but you came out the other end as a writer yeah with yeah. a collection um, I mean I think that I was really disciplined when I was writing it, which is funny now because I'm 
writing my dissertation, and I'm like, how did I <laughs> sit down every day and, and write this? Um, but I don't know. I really feel like it was not easy, but but it seemed to really flow out of me. Like I wrote it in probably three months, mm -hmm. and as my master's dissertation. I mean, a lot of that had to do with like the support that I was getting from Mun and. Lisa was my supervisor, Lisa and Moore, yeah. yes, there was just you know a lot of encouragement um, in that program, and I was you know one of the first cohorts I think of the creative writing stream, mm -hmm. and I just felt encouraged, and like a lot of people were patting me on the back, you know. <laughs> That's all you need as a writer, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> it's <Did> nice. <laughs> Lisa Moore is your instructor. You can't go wrong there. No, <laughs> but, yeah, I was just you know working at Fixed Coffee back in the day. She like came in for a cappuccino and was asking me what I was doing here. And I moved here to intern for Riddle Fence, which is funny because now I'm the editor, but uh, the journal was in like a weird period of flux, I guess a decade ago. And I had was like working at Starbucks, living in my parents' house after I finished my undergrad. And I was like, I'm gonna go to Newfoundland. My mom's from Belle Island. So I have a bunch of family here and my grandparents were on Belle Island. and. I just found my people right away. And Lisa was like, come to a master's at the university. And it all just fell into place. Oh, in nice. Easy way. nice. Yeah. And Donna, for your first collection, did it flow out of you like that? Yeah, I must say it did. And uh, I didn't even know what I was writing. I started as a short story that wouldn't end. And uh, uh, the back story kept coming to the forefront. And I was like, no, 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 you're eight pages long. Get away, get away. And, <laughs> And at some point after I rewrote the story about eight times and I just couldn't make it end because it, all of these other voices kept pushing in. And so I just kind of went with it to see where it would go. I was so naive, I knew nothing. And the, the, it just grew and grew and grew. And at some point it's like, oh my God, I'm writing a book. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. Do you both keep journals? No. You're not a journal? You don't keep journals? Yeah. Oh, the level of detail in your book, I thought, oh, she definitely keeps <laughs> a journal. I feel like sometimes I'll feel compelled to like write a story, and I'll write it, and then like a month will go by, and I, and I won't write. OK. Yeah. What about yeah, you, Donna? No, no, I don't do journals at all. Never did. OK. No, not, ever, not since I uh, found my cousin's, uh, older cousin's diary once and read it. <laughs> <laughs> Blamed it on my sister. <laughs> Uh, but what I read in there shocked the hell out of me. I would never put it on paper. <laughs> yeah. oh. Do you keep a journal? I am a sporadic journal writer, but yeah. it's it's yeah, it's more like ideas and writing yeah. writing ideas than a journal. Yeah. Sometimes it's a journal. Sometimes it's you know I'm angry at such and such a person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no one would ever be able to read my writing. My kids can't read like cursive, so it's like a secret <laughs> language. There you go. You're laughing. You're laughing. There you I'm go. laughing. Yeah. Um, Allison, what's it like to live in St. John's as a young writer? Mm, so good. <laughs> um, you just said you have eight jobs. <laughs> I I do. I was doing my taxes, being like, why am I? working all these jobs, making no money. But I do feel like, um, I don't know, I have my fingers in a lot of pies. Creative yeah. pies, mostly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, I feel like that's, opportunities have just presented themselves in a really nice way, and obviously that's, you know, unique to here in a lot of ways. I yeah. feel like I know a lot of people, and people are so nice to me, and. I don't know, especially at the university, it's just like, I mean, you know, but I feel like I probably wouldn't have said I would be doing a PhD if you had talked to me a decade ago. But I feel like there's just so many people supporting you, and you're yeah. just like, wow, I just fell into this kind of, yeah. yeah. Donna, um, I want to ask you about Cassie Brown, who, oh. you know, she's been one of my North Stars for sure. I, I remember reading her in high school when we had to read her. And it, was, it blew my mind that someone was writing about this place. She was the first person who came into my sphere. What, what role did she play in, in Rage the Night? Um, I, I, I was a late bloomer in all things, I, you know, but uh, I was 32 when I started university, and uh, shame on me, <laughs> fucking shame on me. And I uh, read Cassie Brown probably in my second last year there, and I, I didn't, you heard about this, but I didn't really know of that disaster to the degree that it was. And it just kind of riveted me. And um, 
there was, can this be a little rambly? Yes. Uh, yeah, so anyway, there was, there was a, a couple of things that was, uh, my father had this experience once when he was uh, out seal hunting on the ice, and the ice was broken up from the main, main part of the ocean to shore. And so his friends were at a boat and were ahead of them, and he was behind, and they lost, he lost his boat, him and his friend. So they ended up having to walk on the ice in the dark down towards this island was where they had hoped the boat would have moved ashore and where his friends was. And anyway, as they were walking, a little bit scared, dark, you know, broken ice, yeah. and they saw this little light coming towards them. And it's one of the stories that Dad always tell, used to tell, right? And uh, when the light got closer, they thought it was their friends coming to greet them. And then the light got closer and closer, and Dad and were yelling out, hey, hey, you know, we're here, we're here, and the light just kept coming closer, closer, closer. No sound, no, su no sound. So he thought that his friends were just, you know, hamming it up on them. And, you know, and he was calling out, you know, you fucking bastards, we're here. <laughs> Fuck, yeah, you know. He got... I wondered uh, how long it would take. Yeah, and then the light was there, and then he got, he got scared, and the light just kept on going. It passed him, and it kept on going, and kept on going, and just vanished into the night. And so, when, you know, Dad would always um, reference that story, close the door, don't let the light in, and... <laughs> Don't let the light in, and every, you know, we'd be camping, you know, zip up the tent, don't let the light in. What the fuck is Dad talking about, Ma? <laughs> right? And she told me the story, and we, we, you know, it, it scared him for life. And so it was that story, and uh, Cassie Brown's Death on the Ice. And I also had the story of my uncle, um, who was an orphan, whose mom died, and his father gave him to the Grenfell Orphanage. And back then, you know, you're in the bay, if your mother dies, you got five aunts or ten uncles who just take you in. But not this uncle. He was proud, and he took his three kids and gave them to the orphanage. And so when Uncle Randolph was about, uh, oh, my Jesus, I said his name. Oh, okay. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, that, oh, he died anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uncle Randolph, when he was 15 years of age, they gave him $3 and let them go. And he bought a bologna. A bologna, full bologna, and he walked from Port of Bass to Jackson's Arm. I don't know how many wow. miles that would have been. It took him a week or more. And he went up to his father's door with the bologna as an offering to be taken back in. And I, I was so haunted by that story, it just never would leave me. And so, anyway, rounding up to why I wrote this book and what time, uh, those three stories were always circulating in my head. And I don't know why I linked them, but I somehow linked them. And after I started writing and I ran out of my own family tragedies, this was the one that was left. If I'd waited another two years, I would have had more family tragedies, but uh, <laughs> glad I was to fit this one in. And so, yeah, I just married those three stories together. And so that answers the question that you didn't ask, how come I wrote this book? <laughs> <laughs> this is what you see, nerves. <laughs> nerves on steroids, okay? <laughs> Nerves on steroids. <laughs> Nerves on steroids. Did you listen to the Cassie Brown tapes, the interviews that she I did? I did. I listened yeah. to all of that. They're amazing. And it was amazing, and mm. I became Cassie Brown's biggest fan. I just yeah. loved her. Yeah. Um, it's a good time when you're talking about the light to talk a little bit about myth. You believe that we all live within myth. Yes. And that one of the keys to being a good writer is, is finding that myth in every day. And Allison, you're studying contemporary Irish feminist literature, but I would imagine there's a fair amount of myth, given that it's Irish. For sure. Yeah. So let's talk about myth. So how do you sort of bring it to the fore? You sit down at your computer. How do you tap into myth? I, well, I'm a big student of Carl Jung, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, meaning that I just nibble at corners of his work because he's brilliant and way past anything I could ever follow. But, you know, he said that we are all individually living a myth and that we grow into our myth. And if we look at it like, you know, the ugly duckling myth. I mean, most of us here grew up thinking we were ugly and awful and whatever, especially in our teenage years, you know. So, that, so we are living out the ugly duckling myth. Well, some people live it out all their lives, you know. So what he says is that we, it's for us to discover the myth that we are living and to understand that myth because maybe we need to change the ending of that myth you know, maybe we need to do something. And so when I'm writing, 
I try to find with, a, with the characters just to understand what the archetype they are, what their patterns are, you know, the universality of those patterns and uh, what myth they might be living, even if it is just a side character. And it just helps me guide and steer the character. So it's different with short stories because yours is focused and it's, there's no room for that big learning arc, you know, but with, with, with fiction novels, you've got to have that arc and so you've got more room to develop your side characters as well. And so, so that's what I mean by that, by finding the myth, yeah. yeah. And what about you, Alison? Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this. I am reading Emer McBride and, and Anne Enright and Edna O'Brien and all of these like Amazing. heavy hitters. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and so much of it is about like the, the past or like intergenerational trauma, but the past like informing your, your current reality. And yeah. I thought about that when I was reading your book a lot. Just because, I don't know, I feel like um, obviously we're writing very differently, but I, and like mine is, I, I feel like a lot of the characters are pretty like lonely and lost. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about that in Rome. And I was wondering if you wanted to talk about like this process of getting lost and feeling like the past has to, you know, you kind of have to like circle around and get lost to ultimately find yourself, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Leonard Cohen said that, uh, how can I begin a new tomorrow when I have so much of yesterday still in me? That's totally. be beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, beautiful. So do you agree with that, that you, ha that you have to get your characters lost? I'm thinking about all that stage business on the ice, yeah. which was really masterfully written uh, near the end of the book. And I was also thinking, there's not many pages left. God, I hope they survive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, you know, sure, as you say, you, uh, characters develop as you're writing them. And so, you, you know, okay, if this person is going to die now, then I've got to go back and give him an uh, uh, essence. Uh, you know, I've got to know more of him. Mm -hmm. So characters come, some go, some stay, and you certainly... I'm always going back and redeveloping a character and rebuilding them until I find out who they are and then they're permanent, you know? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell me about tackling the dialect. I mean, I know for you, Donna, you are just, you, are, you grew up in it. Yeah. It's just tapping, I'm probably phoning your sister and having a, having a, you know, a yarn. I don't have no problem with dialect, none at all. <laughs> the old saying, he had a swell bone, cut his cane, couldn't bludge. That's, <laughs> that supper sounds like at our table. No problem, no problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, in terms of research into, uh, you know, the voice of your different characters, because this is a collection of all contemporary young people, but obviously you want them all to be quite different in how totally. they speak. Yes. How do you do that? Uh, I mean, I feel like a lot of them are speaking the same way. There's a lot of likes, <laughs> a lot of ums, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's funny. I mean, definitely my, my family's from here, so I have some sort of understanding about, about what I used to come here. Like, you know, I've never spent a Christmas anywhere but Belle Island in oh, my life. Oh, that's nice. And I don't know, it feels right that I'm here, but I also wanted to, like, be careful because I don't want to be like writing about anything I don't know or writing about a Newfoundland Good experience that I didn't yeah. grow up in. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, because when you want to start sounding contrived, oh, you know, yeah. You, yeah, that's, you lose the authenticity. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And we love the, you know, your, the young voice and the, yeah. how you see it. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Tell me about the conversations you were having with your editor. You were telling me a little bit about that, how there was a kind of pushback from people who may not have, who, who may not know the sort of legendary status of this 1914 ceiling disaster. Yeah, well, it, you know, it, it's so, it was so many people, we know the story so intimately and so well, but a lot of mainlanders, with all due respect. <laughs> okay, sorry, I thought I was in Halifax for a minute. <laughs> but all the mainlanders, they don't really know this story and you know, it's just important for us to keep these stories alive. And the story was never ever written in fiction before, so I, it came to me. You know, it was the voice that was in my head. And so when the penguins got hold of the story, it's like, well, you knew that they wanted me to just, they wanted everything. And it's, so they kept sending it back because they wanted more, they wanted more. And it's like, no, no, 
you know, I'm the author, this is my story, it's Rowan's story, it's a coming of age story. You really, you know, when you're writing fiction based on historical, you, you gotta do a big dance of not letting that historical event, if it's as dramatic as this, mm. not swallowing your story. So I really had to fight hard for them to back off and let my character evolve into who he is. And you know, the, the, the disaster served the character. You know, the character didn't serve the disaster. So it was a lot of pushback, a lot of pushback. They wanted more detail, more this, more that, more everything. And, and it was fiction, you know. I, d I didn't want to exploit the real stories that say Cassie Brown, you know, I mean, gosh, you know, the stories that she told and Gary Collins told in his book, you know, Perished, uh, no, Left to Die, and your uh, Perished. Yeah. Jenny so Higgins I just had book. to do what yeah. came, you know, I knew the story, so I just had to push back and say, no, 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 this is what you're getting. And when you're imposing uh, a dr uh, fiction onto real life, you just, it's, it's timelines you got to follow. So the timelines can is restricting your freedom as a fiction writer as well. In a and good way sometimes. In a good way and in a yeah. bad way because yeah. you, you, you can't squish time to your favor <laughs> because it's like, wait a minute, she's talking about these gull rock here. That, was way back in the peak of Newfoundland, not here. What's she doing with that? You know, tell me a story and our person would write me a letter on that and say, well, you got that fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, guaranteed. Glad you're reading, buddy. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, you, you dance. You got to dance, right? Yeah. Um, why, you're writing a novel now. Uh, I know you're, doing your, you're in PhD land right now, but there is a novel on your desk top. Uh, yeah, well, I've written half a novel. Um, about two girls who have a podcast in town. Oh, fun. And it's about... Have, have what? <laughs> have a podcast okay. in town. And they kind of, like, have some hype around it. And <laughs> they... It's about, like, I don't know, COVID, influencer culture, uh, the internet. Um, you were going to ask about AI, too. I'm going to ask about AI later. The <laughs> inevitable AI question. Yeah. But... Um, what is it? Uh, what are you learning about writing a novel? Do you find it freeing? Do you find it exhausting? I find it, I find it hard. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. There's something about short stories that I really like. As a, I, I like just like short, pithy, mm. full circle, mm -hmm. starting line, ending line. Being able to read it from you know start here. to finish. Yeah, from start <laughs> to finish. Um, no, I, I find it a bit challenging, honestly. But it's nice. I feel like, yeah, it's been deterred a bit because I'm reading a lot of Irish books, <laughs> writing about them. For her comps. Yeah. <laughs> Have you got any advice uh, for yeah, Alison in terms of writing novels uh, and yeah. fighting with your mainline editors? Yeah, you sit in the chair and you keep your butt there. <laughs> yeah. That's what you do. You can't leave it. How long did this take you to write? I probably, you know, in the beginning, like it probably take, took like seven months to get the story first drafted. Uh, but then, you know, it takes another seven months to go back and really do the rewrite. And uh, yeah. yeah, so, you know, I, I averaged three years a book yeah. by the time I conceptualize the idea till the time I can go and buy it on the shelf. It's basically, I've been averaging three years per book. And do you, like, by the seat of your pants or your skirt, like, just sort of start typing and, and hoping well, it's going to come? number one, there's no such thing as a muse. So don't go looking for that. <laughs> it's hard work. It's boring. It's tedious. You've got to get up. You've got to go to work. You've got to sit there, and you don't leave it. And you know, and if a bird sits under your window, you no, know, that moment is not going in your book. Close the window. <laughs> you know, you've you, you got to keep in the seat. If you don't stay there, it won't get done. So that's the biggest challenge, staying there, staying with it. How many hours a day do you write? I get up in the morning and I just go to work, pour the coffee, go to work, and I'm there till around at least 12, one or two. Yeah. And you know, and then it's, but I probably sweat the floor 15 times <laughs> during those hours. Like anything to go avoid that chair, but I won't go far. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And who are your first readers, Donna? Like who do you My trust? My first readers? Who do you trust? Karen Paul, all oh, sitting over there. Elaine Hand sitting over there. Oh, Dick, great. if I had known he lived. I, all my friends, I persecuted them. <laughs> Read this. Some people are shy, right? Some people yeah. hide to work. Not me. I was like, oh, read this, read this, read this. I wrote a metaphor. <laughs> Does she like, listen to your advice idiot. when you give it? Oh, God, let's Karen Potter. Oh, Jesus Christ, I'm listening to the words she said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid not to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> Who's Karen? Which one is Karen? No, I just always ask her questions about the character and stuff like that, where she's going with it. And she usually tells me to fuck off and shut up. <laughs> <laughs> she starts thinking she's writing it. <laughs> all you want to hear is, uh, you're, this is great. This is so good. Yeah. That's all you want to hear. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> What about you, Allison? Do you have early readers or? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, for all of COVID, all of the pan or the pandemic and Snowmageddon, I was living with three other girls and their boyfriends mm -hmm. in a house on Chapel Street. There was like eight of us. So <laughs> I would say all of them were definitely yep. reading my stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know, two of my friends, Isabel and Amelia, are sitting over there. I would say they're both reading stuff pretty early. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I yeah, I, there's definitely a few people I'll send it to, for sure. Okay, so you're not shy about sharing it, or you don't feel it has to be at a certain level before No, you sometimes I'm like, that definitely happened, so hopefully they're fine with it, <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's on the page. Okay, so the inevitable AI question, and you know, AI is dominating a lot of conversations. Should we be worried about it? I don't think, personally, it's AI we should be worried about. It's the billionaires behind the AI. But uh, do you use Grammarly? Uh, Donna? Well, you know, I feel what Allison, you know, she's, you are young, Allison. <laughs> Very young. So for her, it's a whole new world. For me, I feel like I'm leaving it. And um, so I, I just don't pay no attention to it. You just ignore it. I just ignore it. But I mean, if I was 31 starting out, I think it would be a huge concern. Yeah. I mean, it's disconcerting, but it's also like if, you know, I just need to write and as long as I'm writing and putting it out there, it's probably fine, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Let's hope we can just ignore let's, it on let's that hope. level. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I'm going to open up the floor now, because I'm sure there are lots of people with questions. <laughs> Put up your hands if you have a question for Donna or Allison. Oh, here we go. Question number one. This is for Donna. Could you introduce yourself, sir? Yeah, who am I? <laughs> Dick, Dick Cook. Dick Cook. Did you take his okay. pills this morning? This is for uh, Donna. <laughs> okay. Now I understand why I couldn't put down the book. No. The enthusiasm that you were uh, coming off with there when you were reading that was fantastic. Uh, I was just getting concerned you're going to read the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, um, I mentioned to uh, Elaine that I wanted to say to you but I was afraid I was going to be insulting you because um, I can't understand how you, a woman, could get your mind <laughs> around a bunch of sealers in a boat around a bogey and swearing and spitting and all the rest of it. And I felt like I was there. It's probably, it's probably not the best book I read in the last little while, but it's most certainly one of them, and it's most certainly going to be one I'm not going to forget. Thank you. So shall we have the gender as a construct conversation? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have no words, thank you. Thank you. Did you, I mean, you heard all the conversations of the uh, sealers. Um, I, I listened to the um, I listened to some old radio broadcast during World War II for a book that I'm working on, and uh, hearing uh, the cadence, the, the the language, the expressions, but the um, this formality of the um, conversations, which we don't have now, and I guess the formality of being interviewed by Cassie Brown, like what did you hear in those interviews that really? Informs I, I think what, what, I, what I really what I really took away from the Cassie Brown interviews was Cassie Brown herself. Oh, yeah, because uh, I could just see her, you know, coming from Mon, coming from you know uh, town. Yeah, being in way that back position then, of power. When there was such a separation between mm -hmm. you townies and us Baywaps, right? Mm -hmm. But yet she somehow got in there, and she made herself homey enough, sitting around that table with the tape recorder on. And she egged and poked and probed and, you know, made them, brought it out of them. I, she was wonderful. It was, you know, she was an incredible interviewer. I'm, I'm sure yeah. every interview was different, but uh, were sealers willing to share the story or they, would they have to be 
really encouraged. There was a lot of nods. You can tell that she, they were nodding and she would make them verse, converse, you know. Um, there was, you know, always there's somebody who's going to talk to talk and, and just yak, 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 yak. Yeah. And then there's the other ones that are very quiet and shy, you know. So it was a lot of that. But you could see her pulling it out of them and putting in words for them sometimes. And uh, then the missus would be sitting at the table and she'd just chime in and say, you know, what he's trying to say is this. <laughs> she'd tell it for them, you know. But the, the interviews are really, yeah. yeah. You use audio in your writing as well, don't you? Voice memos when you're walking up uh, Signal Hill, you told me I, once. I, I have, yes. I took a, a, a podcast class with Angela a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely sometimes. I feel like, I don't know, I play music. and oh, okay. So I feel like that's all part of you know, being creative. Right. Yeah. And making those characters sing, as it were. Totally. I mean, it's funny that they're the girls in my novel are running a podcast. Yes, mm -hmm. I look forward to reading it. I'll <laughs> yeah. be an early reader. Let yeah. me read it. You can. You can. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got any more questions? I'm sure there are. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> my name is Sandy Macerlian, and uh, Donna, I have read most of your books. And when I read them, I read them with other friends that don't live in Newfoundland, but that are all from Newfoundland. And we get on the phone and we talk about your books. So it's a great source of bringing us all together. Nice. One of the questions that came up in our discussions was from your book, Plucked. And it was about the moment of grace. Would you be able to speak a little bit as much as you want to about that. We're all wondering about that moment of grace, but other moments of grace, perhaps, that you have had and how they've affected your writing and your life. What was that moment particularly that you're saying? Uh, as I recall, it was the one when your brother had done something really, really awful. And it was an act of forgiveness. I can't remember. Yeah, uh, the, uh, you know, when you're writing something, you're distanced from it, and when you uh, think something, you're distanced from it. When you talk about it, uh, you, you know, that was a, a grace that was given to me uh, because my brother got killed on my watch, and so he rescued me from my shame and, and guilt, the two ugly sisters, I call them, and, uh, and it was a manifestation of sorts that's really hard to talk about like this because most people will find it hard to believe that things can happen like manifestations of the spirit. And so in Pluck, when I'm writing it, and if you have your reader with you and they believe your voice, you can take them anywhere. So in the book, I was willing to go into these places where things happened to me, and I was convinced that my reader would follow me there and accept what I was saying. Um, so yes, these moments of grace, and when my brother somehow was able to communicate to me that no, no, none of us here are responsible for these tragedies that happen in our lives. It doesn't matter if you were even pulling the trigger to the gun that killed the person, you still weren't responsible because there's so much more coming into this moment, you know. From like, like Grenfell said, we go back to God and there's this happening and that. My mother married my father who had me, who had my brother. The times were poor and we end up in Alberta. He gets killed and the guy wasn't paying. There's just so much coming together in every moment that when that tragedy descends, you know, you, it's not you. You didn't kill your brother. You weren't responsible for your brother's death. It was the universe coming together in that second and you were as big a victim as your brother was, you know, and so, when these things happen in life and you get it, you see the truth of it, and to me that's a grace. I was given a grace in that moment. After seven years of guilt and shame, I was given a grace and I was able to rise above the horror of what I felt I had brought about, you know, and that is a grace. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Allison, I want to ask you how your friends feel when you're writing in your notes app uh, and they know something they've said or done is going to end up in one of your stories. <laughs> you should ask them. 
Um, I mean, yeah, I definitely feel like this book especially is like, it's a lot of stories my friends have told me. Yes. Sure. Yeah. And is that why you give them the early read option? Um, that's probably part of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I hopefully, I feel like I have some, you know, I should understand how to, how to do it gracefully. You right, know? right. And not be changing details. Uh, <laughs> That would be incriminating, you know. Do the friends want to ask about that? <laughs> um, I Please say your name. Amelia Harris. Yes. yes. Um, I, to answer that question, <laughs> I guess, I think it's very exciting and flattering. It's like if someone wants to paint your picture. Um, and it's just, it's a very special connection and it's nice to see um, someone to see how someone you love sees you and kind oh, of expressing nice. that um, in an, an Allison's like beautiful and artistic way in her oh. so it's special you're in good hands with Thank Allison you. Graves <laughs> <laughs> okay have we got any other questions Question. Oh, someone has a question? Oh, I Heidi. have a question. Heidi, who matches the Coastline's logo today? Yes. Stand up, Heidi. It was, it was intentional. <laughs> um, Donna, you mentioned earlier that uh, writing something historical, you feel a little bit constricted because you have to stick to the events. So I'm just wondering how you escape that. Do you, in your earlier drafts, do you kind of forget about the history and then go back and check to make sure it's accurate? Or what's your process for? you know, breaking, still feeling free, but also sticking to the history. Yeah, I think it was uh, some philosopher way back in Socrates' day said that, um, you know, there is more truth in fiction than there is in, uh, say, memoir. And given how he was Socrates' buddies, you know, I'm not gonna argue with that. Uh, <laughs> but you know, the point he was making is that when we write through the archetype the, you know, uh, it's a universal, we have the freedom, we connect with the essence of the character and the story, and whereas when we're writing a memoir, we're, uh, attack, um, we're tied to fact, and, and we don't have that freedom of being able to expand. So when I was writing uh, the fiction part of this book, I really took liberty to go into the freedom of fiction and to find you know, the energy and the archetypes and the arc of the story and to find the themes and like the purpose of the story and keep that. So by the time I got to this end of the story that is nonfiction, I was able to keep my themes going and able to keep that arc going and encapsulate what I could of the actual time and, and the factual experiences remain true to them. But again, that was quite the dance to do that. Um, um, but um, I, I did it, didn't I, Dick? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, does that answer the question? It does, yes, yeah. yeah. And I can see how incorporating the myth that you were all talking about earlier would help bring the imaginative aspect to the history as well. So, yeah, great yeah, answer. It was a tragedy. Thank you. There's no other word for it. It was a tragedy. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I told Donna at the beginning of this, um, earlier this morning, that my great grandfather was in that disaster. And him and a bunch of men from Turks Cove and Trinity Bay uh, said, Shag this, you know, this is crazy. We're going back. <laughs> and as a child, I knew this story, but didn't know it meant back to the boat. It was only when I read, uh, I thought they walked back to like their community. It just didn't make sense. Uh, and his name is in the back of Cassie uh, Brown's book, uh, which of course brought it alive for me in, in a way as well. But when I read Jenny Higgins' amazing book, uh, Perished, she has all these um, crew lists and letters, and it's just it's a really beautiful collection of visual ephemera and storytelling ar around that disaster. And I was able to put together that, no, they walked back. They were the first group to walk yes. back to the boat. And that's yeah. in Donna's book. So I can attest to its authenticity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 They made it back. They were, you know, court martial. They were, would have faced court, court martial if it hadn't yeah. been for the disaster that proved they were right to go they back. They have yeah. the fear. They weren't afraid. Yeah. Any questions? Oh, Elaine's going to ask a question. Hi. 
Identify um, yourself, please. I am Elaine. I'm <laughs> Elaine Han, and um, I've known Donna Morsi ever since she wore eight pairs of tights to make her legs look big enough. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I, know, I know that of which uh, I speak. Um, Angela, thank you very much for today, because it is the juxtaposition of the two styles of writers that we're exposed to. It reminds me of the t-shirt that says, so many books and so little time. Yeah. And, um, and I value both styles that are presented today. And um, Donna, you take a story like, Rowan realizes he's more than an orphan. He goes up to say goodbye to Grenfell. He then gets on his um, sleigh and rides out of town. And you give, through that very simple reading, a full development of character uh, that I have watched um, find its footing in you. And I wonder how do you sit there? I've seen the chair. Mm -hmm. I've seen the chair and the table and the bird, probably, you know, that fights for her attention. But do you sit there and are you even aware of what is coming to you? as you fill out the frame of that character no. and that character God, development? No, no uh, you, I don't know if you've noticed, but I do this a lot. <laughs> and you know, Karen, friend Karen is always putting her hand on my leg, stop it, we're watching a movie, and I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you sit there, you don't know what's coming. I mean, you're rocking it out of you, you know. <laughs> and uh, no, you just never know. You just, you're just in there, and you just got to follow it. And I. You know, with the very, I trusted after the second novel, and somebody said to me, you know, you write your first one, can you write a second? And I was like, I don't know. And I did not think so. But then I wrote the second one, and then my agent said to me, you know, number one, if you wrote that first book and it's all a lie, you don't have to worry. You know, you got, you got 10 more, because that was a, a yarn you made up. And so you don't listen to that. But after I wrote my <laughs> second novel, I kind of trusted that there was, would be a third. And so I always go back to that, is that you gotta trust it, and that's what I mean, you gotta stay with it. Because if you don't stay with it, you won't find it. But you gotta trust that it's going to come, because it came twice before, it's going to come again. You know? And you, Allison, you're so young. <laughs> Child, <laughs> Jesus. I was wearing 12 pairs of tights trying to make my legs fat when I was your age. So I could walk downtown, you know? Um, <laughs> But you know, you find out, maybe you're not, a, not a, a, a novelist, maybe you are a short story writer. I tried to be a short story writer, but I was a novelist. And so, you know, you find that out as you go. What are your stories to what, you know? Anyway, that's kind of aimless. <laughs> you, you have to stay open, I guess, to not the muse, because there is no, no such thing. No such thing. You are the muse. You are the muse. Yeah. How do you do it, Alison? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I you walk like... up Signal Hill every day, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that gets, that gets things going. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm just trying to stay attentive out here <laughs> and yeah. record it and read a lot, you know? Yeah, yeah. And there's, yeah, a lot of young writers that I, that I really like and I'm inspired by, especially in Ireland right now. Yeah. So that's what I'm, what I'm reading a lot of. But I don't know. I think just, yeah, noticing things that are particularly special. Mm -hmm. And we saw some of that in your photos, too, I think. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Quirky photos. I saw that. <laughs> Maybe it's a good time to ask you for your picks. My picks. You have five picks of writers? Yes. I. Do you remember <laughs> your five what? picks? I, def I definitely wrote them down. They're <laughs> lying. Oh, oh, here they are. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, a lot of these people are my friends. Carmela's one of my very good friends. Her stories are something that I found really inspiring. Incredible. Came out, like yep. two years before mine, I guess. Um, and Carmela lives in town. Eva is, has written three books at this point, but I remember feeling pretty inspired by her short stories. She's living in Montreal now, but is back pretty frequently. Um, I don't read a lot of poetry, but Andrea Callanan is amazing, and she just finished her PhD at the university. Um, and she wrote The Debt. Um, Small Game Hunting is, you know, uh, Megan Gale Cole's just a character. 
Um, Her characters are, have a lot in similarity lifestyle-wise with yours. Totally, yeah. yeah. I feel like especially, um, yeah, just talking about like restaurants and serving. That and, life, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, having like an artistic life and also having a service job and how weird and volatile they can be. <laughs> yeah. um, but she's obviously amazing and I feel like if you guys haven't read these books, you should because they're amazing. And Donna, you have some picks too. Do yeah. you remember um, yours? I, oh, I'd like to know. preface this by saying that uh, I uh, recommend anything that was written by Lisa Moore, Michael Cromie, and Wayne Johnston. Anything. <laughs> okay? But these were, you know, my obscure picks. Uh, Left to Die, Gary Collins, because the intro alone was so beautiful because he talked with one of the survivors and it was one of the survivors of that disaster. He told him the story in the truck. He had Gary sobbing and weeping, and he had me sobbing as I read the intro. And those last words to Gary before he got into the truck was, don't let our stories die, boy. I keep telling our story. And you know, it kind of gave me permission, because it was such a daunting story. I was afraid of it. But when I read that in research, it gave me permission. And I called up that guy, Gary, and he just has this huge, big, beautiful Newfoundland heart, and he became my support guy, so I love him. And that book tells the harshness of the real stories, not the fiction ones. Um, no Turning Back, that is the um, story of a mother who lost five of her children in a house fire, and Jesus, and whatever she's got to say, I'm there, I'm listening, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, Death on the Ice, again, needs no introduction, Casey Brown. I couldn't have wrote the book without it because she's the only, she is the master of that tale. And My Life with Trees is a friend of mine, Gary Saunders, who uh, he's just a beautiful poetic writer that uh, he writes about things. He, make, he takes the ordinary and makes them extraordinary. He just writes about real things and real moments. And this is a bit of an autobiography of his life with trees. Uh, he's a forester. And so I just, that's what I, Oh, nice. Yeah. Thank you both yeah. for your picks. But, or, you know, and I think we both say, you want a good book, Lisa Moore, Michael Cromwell, oh, yeah. Wayne Johnston, Donna Morrissey, and... Uh, <laughs> Alison Graves. Fellow hair. Yeah. <laughs> and perhaps it's a good time to point out that the Munn Bookstore is here. And you can get many of these books over there at that table this morning. So uh, we don't have a new pick coming up for Coastlines uh, because we've mashed March and April together here on the couch. Uh, but we are going to talk about Sparks, which is the literary festival run out of Mann. Um, and it's coming up. And we would like you all to participate April 28th at the LSPU Hall. Great readings uh, from many of the students. Allison will be there. <laughs> um, they have a guest coming in from Ireland as well. Um, and uh, it's always great. Yeah, here we go. Here are some of the amazing writers. Lindsay so can Bird. I be there next year? <laughs> yeah, Definitely. yeah, make a pitch. Who do you, who do you pitch? Have, uh, we'll find out for you, Donna. Karen Pottle. Yeah, you'll have, to, what? Karen Pottle. Karen Pottle. <laughs> I want to give a big shout out to the Mighty Coastlines team. We are uh, quite the force uh, and our partners NL Libraries and Writers NL for continuing to help make Coastlines happen. Um, if you enjoyed today, please tweet or Instagram about it at Memorial U Alumni at Memorial underscore HSS because you know you can never take these types of events for granted. You never know if there'll be another one, unless you tell people that you really loved it. <laughs> so thanks to both of you. Yeah. This has been great. And please chat with the writers. Ask them for their autographs. Ask the question you were too shy to ask out loud. And thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you. I have no idea. I'm too